Okay, so my name is Nancy Hammond. I am the owner of Integrate 360 Physical Therapy, which is the only postural restoration center within 300 miles of St. Louis. So I'm here today to talk to you guys about postural restoration, which we call PRI. So the Postural Restoration Institute is located in Lincoln, Nebraska. It was started in 2000 by Ron Hareska to explore and explain the science of postural adaptations, asymmetrical patterns, and the influence of polyarticular chains of muscle on the body. The mission of the Institute is based on the development of an innovative treatment approach that addresses the primary contributions of postural kinematic movement dysfunction. The Institute is dedicated to clinical education, research, and the ongoing search for improved pathways of physical medicine. PRI is creating resources, education opportunities, research, and patient care programs to assist those who wish to maximize their assessment and intervention skills in the areas of respiration, myokinematics, neuromuscular applications, postural imbalances, and visual function. So it's a very integrated approach. We really look at the whole system. So if you haven't already, I would encourage you to check out Postural Restoration and their website. Um, on there you'll see a course schedule, and then articles, interviews, case studies, a blog, and then there's a whole network of certified practitioners throughout the country and even the world now. Um, I don't know, if, for those of you who haven't taken a course, I would highly recommend it, and they, they host them all throughout the country. So what is posture, as defined by Ron Hareska? Posture is a reflection of the position of many systems that are regulated, determined, and created through limited functional patterns. And for me, that's what sets PRI apart, is that we really look at the position of the body before we start strengthening. These patterns reflect our ability and inability to breathe, rotate, and rest symmetrically with the right, the right and left sides of the body. So symmetry with growth and neurodevelopment is influenced by genetics, respiratory function or dysfunction, and the opposition or lack of opposition to muscular forces guided by functional habit, visceral orientation, respiratory imbalances, cortical dominant, developmental reflexes, and environmental influences. Okay, so what does that mean? So if you have a tall, thin person, chances are their parents were tall and thin. So they're going to have a tendency then to be more neck breathers and not breathe with their diaphragm as much. So that's what genetic means. So typically what, you know, what pattern your parents were in is going to be passed down. Um, visceral orientation, again, that's something that is unique with the Institute. And we talk about <clears throat> asymmetry or asymmetri asymmetrical organ structure inside the body. So there's three lobes of the lung on the right, two on the left because you have, because you have your heart on the left. Your liver supports your diaphragm on the right side, and on the left side you just have your tiny spleen. So what does that mean? Your liver keeps your diaphragm domed and in a good position on that right side, so that left diaphragm tends to get flattened out and weakened. Um, also, I think that's it. Oh, the other thing I was going to say is the diaphragm has a stronger attachment to the spine on the right, so it's going to help rotate your spine to the right. Most people are left brain dominant, so they're right side dominant. So if you watch most people stand, they're going to stand on that right leg with that right shoulder lower. When you stand on that right side, that left pelvis tends to rotate forward. When that left pelvis comes forward, that left rib cage tends to flare. So we'll talk more about this, but that's kind of what sets the boundary or the principle for that pattern. So we talk about polyarticular muscle chains, and what is that? It's a muscular chain that set is a muscular chain is a set of polyarticular muscles that follow each other and overlap in the same direction with no break in continuity. So basically muscles that are crossing multiple joints and they just they don't there's no break in them. They just there's a continuous band of muscles. So we have that one chain is called the anterior interior chain, or AIC. And most people will fall into a left AIC pattern. Again, that means they're standing more on their right, their right side with that left pelvis rotating forward. So if you hear me say they're in a left AIC pattern, that's what that refers to. So there's two anterior interior polyarticular muscle chains that have a significant influence on respiration, rotation of the trunk, rib cage, spine, and lower extremities. 
The AIC is composed of muscles that attach to the costal cartilage and bones of ribs 7 through 12 to the lateral patella, head of the fibula, and lateral condyle of the tibia. One's on the left and one's on the right. So the muscles that make up this AIC include the diaphragm and the psoas, as well as the iliacus, the TFL, the vastus lateralis, and the biceps femoris. This chain provides the support and anchor for abdominal counterforce, trunk rotation, and flexion movement. So I know this is a lot of information and we'll get to what it actually applies to here in a minute. So here you can see the optimal position and suboptimal position of this AIC. So here on the left you can see the optimal position and that this hook up here is supposed to re represent the diaphragm. So you can see that diaphragm is domed and in a good position for respiration. On the right side it's flattened out. On this left side you can see the pelvis is rotated back. On the right it's rotated forward. Then we have the brachial chain of muscles. So there's two brachial polyarticular muscle chains lying over the anterior pleural and cervical area, so here in the front of your body. These change in, chains influence cervical rotation, shoulder dynamics, and apical inspirational expansion, so how well you're able to get air into your upper chest wall. The brachial chain is composed of muscles that attach to the costal cartilage and bone of ribs four through seven and the xiphoid process to the posterior inferior occipital bone anterior inferior mandible and coracoid process of the scapula. These muscles provide the support and anchor for cervical cranial orientation and rotation and rib position. So here you can see the optimal position and suboptimal position of these muscles. So here everything looks pretty balanced. On the right side you can see things are pulled more to the right. And here on the left side, you can see those ribs are more in a position of internal rotation. On the right side, they're more in a position of external rotation. This illustration is to show you the difference between the right diaphragm and the left. So here you can see that right diaphragm is bigger. It's also more domed. It has a bigger attachment at the spine. Here you can see that the brachial chain, and so the BC and the AIC are just continuous and one will affect the other. So again, that's why it's more of an integrated approach because what happens at the pelvis affects the thorax, what happens at the thorax affects the pelvis. So now that I've described a little bit what this left AIC, right BC pattern is, what will you see in your clients that this looks like? So one or both legs may turn out when sitting, standing, or lying down. I'm sure you've all seen this. Because that pelvis is rotated forward, they're in external rotation, the femur is going to follow. There will be overdevelopment of compensatory muscles. So the latissimus, you can see here in this upper middle picture, that individual is most likely breathing with his gastroc. He's using it to survive. The vastus lateralis, here you can see overdevelopment of the pecs and the neck muscles and paravertebral muscles. I'm sure you've seen some of these in your clients. Or maybe even yourself. Okay, so like I talked about earlier, the favorable standing position is people like to stand on their right side with that left pelvis rotated forward. So if you go to the grocery store, or look around the gym, you're going to see people standing like this. When you put them over on their left leg with their right leg forward, it's going to feel very awkward. They'll walk with little or no arm swing on that right side. Why is that? Because when they stand on their right side, the compensatory movement is to rotate the trunk to the left so that they're going to go forward. So they're stuck in this left trunk rotation, so it's going to be very difficult for them to rotate to the right. If they can stand better on their left leg, they're going to be able to rotate their trunk to the right. So if you watch people walk, because they don't have that right trunk rotation, they're not going to swing their right arm. This is always an interesting one. Elevated anterior ribs on the left. 
So if you guys even just lay down and put your hands on your rib cage, you'll probably notice that you have more of a flare on that left side than you do on the right. Again, because you don't have that liver on that left side keeping that diaphragm domed and in a good position. And because when you stand on that right leg, left pelvis comes forward, that left rib cage is going to flare. That, those left abdominals get weakened. Lowered and depressed shoulder and chest on the right. Again, if you're standing on your right side, that right shoulder is going to be lower. You may see asymmetry of the, in the, of the head and the face, just depending on how much they're set in their pattern and how much their cervical cranial is driving their bus. But here you can see the difference in her, in the midline, you can see the difference in the height of her eyes. One eye is more open than the other. She's shifted. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Curvature of the spine, which is scoliosis. So basically what this means is that somebody is stuck in this curvature. Scoliosis is not necessarily a bad thing. They're just stuck in this pattern. They can't get over here. So objective findings. So what would I see when, I, when somebody comes into my clinic? So there's specific tests that we do to objectively see what position their body's in. So they'll have an inability to adduct their left femur if they're in a left AIC pattern which means that their left knee will not drop down to the table. You can see in the bottom picture his right knee is growing, going down to the table. His left femur is seated in his acetabulum. I'm, I'm sorry, did I say left? His right femur is seated in his acetabulum where it should be. His left is not because that pelvis is rotated forward. Can you guys get a, do you have an appreciation for that? Hmm? So if this, if this, if you're standing on your right side, this left pelvis comes forward, this femur is going to rotate forward with it. So here you are, this is a left AIC pattern. This left pelvis rotates forward, femur comes with it and turns out, which is why that left, that left leg is going to turn out. Right leg may compensate and also come forward. This is not in my presentation, but we call this a PEC pattern. That means now somebody's forward on both sides. They're going to extend at their lumbar spine, and they're going to tend to use muscles of their back to survive. I can tell you most of the people I see are PECs. I love it on a day when somebody comes in a left AIC pattern. Yes, they've compensated for their left AIC. But what's important to remember is that under every PEC pattern is a left AIC pattern. So PEC is just compensating for that left AIC pattern. What's worse than a PEC? A patho PEC. What's that? So patho PEC means that they've overstretched, and we'll, t we'll look at that here in a minute, but they've overstretched their hamstrings, they've overstretched their pelvic floor muscles, they've overstretched ligaments in their back, ligaments in the front of their hips. Because over time, they've compensated for that pattern, and they've overstretched to function and get where they want to be. You know, people think, oh, I need to stretch my hamstrings, I need to stretch my hamstrings. But if you're not, your pelvis is in, not in the right position, should not be stretching hamstrings. Yes. So can you restore original length? No. You need to make forward up in muscle stability. So if somebody is pathological in their hip, which inability. What happened to that picture? That's really weird. Okay, well the top picture is supposed to be... Anyway, the top picture is supposed to be that the left leg will... See how this right leg is fully dropping down? When they do it on the left side, it does not fully drop down. So that's actually a good thing. It means they're not pathological. When, um, so let's pretend this was a PEC person and that right leg fully dropped down, that would be bad. That would mean that they've overstretched ligaments in the front of their hip. You won't get that ligament stability back, so we know we need to make that up in muscle strength. I don't know what happened to that picture. 
Okay. True. I wonder if I edited it or something on accident. Anyway, so they're going to have limited trunk rotation to the right. Remember, we talked about that. So that means their knees are going to be more limited going to the left than they are to the right. So here this is showing she has good left tr trunk rotation, so we like to stand on our right side again. We can rotate our trunk to the left. It's harder for us to stand on our left leg and rotate our trunk to the right. If they would have full trunk rotation to the right and they're in a left AIC pattern, it means they've overstretched ligaments in their low back, which is pathological and not a good thing. So in a right BC pattern, you're going to tend to see limited right shoulder internal rotation. Again, that's because of this left rib flare and because of the position of that right scapula. That right scapula doesn't have a place to sit against that thorax, so you're going to have limitation in that right shoulder rotation. The left one will fully rotate. Limited horizontal abduction on the left. So you can see her left arm is not going down as far as her right. Again, because they're in that left trunk rotation position, they don't have, they're already there, so they don't have any range of motion to go. Because they can't rotate to the right, you have full range of motion on this side. You may see asymmetrical hip rotation. So because they can't get back into that left hip, you're going to have limited hip internal rotation on that left side. If they are in a left AIC pattern and they have excessive rotation, it's most likely pathological. And you need, once you get them in the right position, then you need to work on strengthening those muscles to help stabilize that hip. You may see excessive or limited straight leg raise. Top picture does not make me happy. Too much. Especially if that pelvis is not in the right position. Well, the I actually like the bottom one better. No, you may see it. Yeah, they're most likely going to have it on the right too. Depending, but if she's that hypermobile, she's probably going to be hypermobile on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. But once you position this bottom, reposition this bottom pelvis, most likely you're going to get ha gain hamstring length because it's not a muscle stretch issue. It's that leg tension relationship. And once you reposition the pelvis, you're going to gain that length. Inability to touch their toes. So again, if they're stuck in this pattern, it's good that they can't touch their toes. So if someone's not in the right position to have them keep trying to touch their toes, it's most likely going to make them pathological. If they can palm the floor, again, they're pathological. They've overstretched. Because she's not, her pelvis is not in the right position, her femurs are forward and her acetabulum's in her hips, inability to fully squat. Also probably has tight posterior mediastinic, mediastinum expansion, so it's hard for her to open up that back. And you can see her feet are turned out. Okay, so clinical assessment. So like we talked about, the left pelvis is anteriorly tipped and forwardly rotated. So here we are, left side's forward. Everybody can see that? You have an appreciation for what that is. The forwardly rotated left denominant causes the lower spine to orient to the right with the upper spine to the left. So here we are, rotate left. Because you have that bigger attachment on the right side of that diaphragm, it's going to pull the spine to the right. You may see tight paravertebral muscles on the right side. If somebody bend, bends forward, they more, more, may have more tension in, that, in those right paravertebral muscles. Oh, my right low back really hurts. The diaphragm's pulling them to the right side because they're in this left AIC pattern. This directional rotational influence on the low back and spine to the right mandates compulsive compensatory movement in one or more areas of the trunk upper extremities, and cervical cranial mandibular muscle. So basically, it's just going on up the chain. It's compensating. What happens at the pelvis, you co compensate for in the thorax, and sometimes up into the cranium and cervical spine. The greatest impact is on rib alignment and position, therefore influencing breathing patterns and ability. So the next few slides are just reiterating what this position looks like, like I've shown you on 
the pelvis. So that left side is rotated forward, and then the sacrum, lowest part of your spine here, is going to compensate. So left comes forward, you can see that sacral torsion. So people who have SI pain, they're probably stuck in a left AIC pattern. And they can have left or right SI pain, depending on if, usually it depends on if they're pathological or not. Again, you can see that left pelvis is forward, sacrum is torqued. This is just a view from the back. This is an X-ray image, just to show that left AIC pattern with right sacral torsion. And then there's one more, this is an MRI. So they were able to find these patterns, it's just a common human compensatory pattern. So how do we treat this? Now that you guys have a little bit of an understanding of what a left AIC pattern is, what are we gonna do about it? First thing we're gonna do is restore pelvic position and muscular balance. Again, if I have to if you leave here with one message, it's you have to restore position. Before you can start strengthening, you have to reposition. These are some techniques that we do, and we can go over these here in a, a few minutes. But basically in these images, we're using the left hamstring to pull that left pelvis back in a flex position in the lumbar spine and pelvis. So we're getting their pelvis back using their hamstring to, to pull that pelvis back. In this bottom picture, she has her arm up. We're trying to restore that right apical expansion, which we'll look at here too in a minute. You may have seen this. It's just left side lying, knee toward knee. Again, trying to reposition and then to get that right glute max and that left inner thigh muscle working. Because once we get that left pelvis and hip repositioned, we want to work on securing it there. And that's what we're going to use that left adductor for. Restoring strength once we get in the right position. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen the retro stairs, but it's a good activity for getting the glutes going once you're in the right position. So you can tell she's flexed in her spine, and then she's really shifting back into that left hip. She's going to use her glute to advance herself up that step. We want to restore apical chest wall expansion. So balloons are a big thing for us. It gets the diaphragm going and the abdominals working. So basically we're just throwing a balloon here in that 90-90 position with the pelvis in a good position, flexed, with the hamstrings on, trying to fill up that right upper chest wall with air. Because we lose, remember we lose that right trunk rotation, we're gonna lose that right apical expansion. Another position here, she's just reaching. Again, trying to open up that right chest wall. That reach is gonna help get those left ribs down. We want to restore diaphragmatic breathing. So using a balloon, help get those ribs down to help get that diaphragm engaged. Picture on the right, she's opening up her right chest wall, getting those left ribs down and those left abs on to help restore that left diaphragm. Remember that right diaphragm is nice and strong. It has a liver that's supporting it. It has a bigger attachment. That left diaphragm tends to get weakened. So this is the same position you just saw. She's just using a balloon in this position. She also has a towel under her left knee. She's pushing down to get some right, I'm sorry, left inner thigh, pushing her right knee down to get some right glute. We want to restore abdominal opposition to the diaphragm. So remember we talked about that left abdominal wall tends to get weak. Here she's just getting those left abs on just to help secure that, those left ribs and that left diaphragm. And this is something that I tend to do on both sides. More on the left than the right. Some other activities that you can use a little bit higher level. Probably why a child's doing it. And we want to restore chest wall flexibility. So you've seen me use this with people laying over the ball just to help open up that right chest wall. So if you open up that right chest wall, it's going to help get those, again, those left ribs down and that left diaphragm engaged. This bottom picture I like, you just need to make sure that they stay in a flex position and not let their, their spine extend because then their pelvis is going to come forward and you're right back where you started. So they need to maintain that posterior pelvic tilt and keep those ribs down. 
but that really helps open up that chest wall. This is good to use for somebody who's a, who's a neck breather. If they use their neck for breathing, it's going to help inhibit that anterior neck. Some other techniques to get chest wall flexibility. Here you can see that she's maximizing that left AFIR position, so she's really getting back into that left hip and opening up that right chest wall. Because if she opens up that right chest wall, she's going to close down that left one. So these are some recommendations for achieving and maintaining symmetry. You may find these helpful to use in your own life, and these are things that I usually teach most of our clients. Standing. It's no surprise that you want to stand more with weight on your left leg than your right. So left foot's going to be behind right. And when you do that, you want to think about shifting back onto your left heel, not out to the side, but back onto your heel at a diagonal. When you sit, you want to sit with your knees at the level of your hips or slightly above, because that's going to help get those femurs seated in your acetabulum. And then you can think about shifting your left knee back to help get that femur back in your acetabulum. So when you drive, instead of let, letting that left knee rotate out against the door, keep it straight. And then the, the driving photo is just showing the, the right knee goes forward. It's going to make the left one come back. Sleeping, he has a pillow under his left side, again, just to get those left ribs down and get those left abs going to be in a better position, and a pillow between his knees. The working position, again, he has, he's getting his left ribs down, so he's opening up that right side and closing down that, those left ribs. Another missing picture. Um, we want to make sure that they have the ability to shift weight over their left hip as well as the right. So it's going to be real easy to go to the right, not as easy to go to the left. So we want to make sure that when this is basically half of the gait cycle, but you also have to be able to get onto your left side. And then we want to alternate back and forth. So we want to end up with an alternating reciprocal gait that leads with the right arm and the left leg. Because if you lead with your right leg, it's going to force you back into that left hip. and then they will have the ability to touch their toes and fully squat. I don't know what happened to my pictures, but Bobby was fully squatting in this picture. I think it was the, uh, drive, uh, oh. Thank you. <laughs>